Hey friends, welcome back. It's a time for another gathering for worship. And if you were with us last week, you know that I started a new sermon series that was focusing in on the book of Joshua. For those of you that are not familiar of its location or, or its significance in our copy of God's Word, is the book of Joshua is found in the Old Testament. It is the fifth book. It's Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Number, Deuteronomy. It's actually the sixth book, uh, followed by Joshua. Many say that Joshua is that book that continues building upon the foundation that Moses laid himself in the writing of the Pentateuch or the writing of the Torah. And what's interesting about it is, is that last week, as I shared with you, the story of Joshua doesn't actually begin in Joshua 1.1. We are introduced to Joshua six, seven different times in the opening books of the Old Testament, in the writings of Moses. We see that Joshua was Moses' assistant. He was with him in some of the most difficult days of his ministries and his obedience to the Lord. And he was with him during some of the celebrations. We know that Joshua was being groomed for such a time as this. If you remember last week, I opened up our series by reading to you out of the writings in the book of Deuteronomy. Actually, it was in Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 20. And there in that text, if you have a copy of God's Word, you can open it up with me and read along. In Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 20, Moses is writing there that we uh, understand. It says, Love the Lord your God. Obey Him. Remain faithful to Him. For He is your life. And He will prolong your life in the land that the Lord swore to give to your fathers, to give to Abraham, to give to Isaac, and to give to Jacob. If you remember last week, I said it said, Love the Lord your God, to obey Him and remain faithful to Him. Well, if you've studied in the book of Deuteronomy at all, you know that that sounds very familiar to an opening verse in Deuteronomy. Actually, in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 5, where it says, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, your mind, and your soul. And then in the New Testament, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, the risen Messiah, is using that same verse in sharing with the disciples. And he says, and to do so with all your strength. And that is known as the Shema, the things that are what we are supposed to do. And what's interesting is, is that our Jewish friends, they recite this on a regular basis, just like we would recite the Lord's Prayer. But what Moses was doing for a young student, for a young one that he was mentoring and walking with and teaching him, he gave him three things to focus in on. He said, first is to love the Lord your God, and then obey Him and remain faithful to Him. And in doing so, for He is your life and He will prolong your life in the land that the Lord swore, that the Lord promised to give to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So Joshua had a very clear-cut step and pattern and plan that was laid out before him to love, to obey, and remain faithful. So today, after I pray, we will open up in Joshua chapter 1, and we will read verses 1 through 9, and we will focus in on this introductory book in this introductory chapter to a book that basically what Joshua is being told to do is to go be great. Will you join with me as we pray? Heavenly Father God, I just uh, give you all the honor and glory. I give you all the praise. And Lord, I thank you for the opportunity to sit down and to gather together and to worship and to remember what our calling is. And that is to go and that is to be great. And that is to, to share uh, what exactly has taken place and what God ultimately, what you ultimately want to do in the lives of the individuals around us and with us and through us. So, Lord, today as we open up your word, as we go back into the Old Testament and we look at this biblical character, we look at his challenges, his celebrations, his difficulties, Lord, remind us that even as he was prepared for such a task as this, we are prepared as well. So, Lord, guide us today as we open your word that we would read it, that we would learn from it, and that ultimately we would seek to apply it in all that we do. For it's your name we do pray and amen. So what I want us to focus in on today is this simple statement that God will faithfully, as we've seen throughout history, as we've seen in many other testimonial situations, God will faithfully lead His people through uncertain times. And He will do so by His faithful presence. He will do so with His guidance. And we know that because the book of Joshua picks up where Deuteronomy left off, as it's continuing the story of the people of God. See, Joshua here is going to demonstrate how God would fulfill 
his covenant promise, his promise to what we call the patriarchs, as I read to you in Deuteronomy 30, 20, which was the promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to give the land of Canaan to their descendants. But when we open up the book of Joshua, verse 1 sets the narrative for all that was going to take place in the preceding or the following 24 chapters. Because it says right there in the book of Joshua, it picks up in verse 1 by saying, after the death of Moses. It says, after the death of Moses, the Lord's servant, who did the Lord speak to? Well, when you look there in verse 1, it says, and the Lord spoke to Joshua, who was identified as the son of Nun, who had served Moses's. See, what is taking place here is that over a period of about 40 years, Moses, our lead biblical character in the first five books of the Bible, led the people of Israel out of bondage in Egypt into the edge of the promised land. However, due to his own sin, because remember, Moses was human as too and made poor choices, due to his own sin at Merbath, which is recorded in Numbers, in Numbers chapter 20, Moses himself was not going to be permitted to enter into the promised land. So what did that leave for God to do? God select Joshua to lead the people into the promised land without his faithful leader, the one that he was a servant to, Moses. So we can read on and talk about that what takes place in verses 1 and 2 of the book of Joshua in chapter 1 is we see that the transition's taking place. The transition from the obedient one of Moses to now the chosen one in Joshua. We see that God's servant, the leader, is buried, but the work will continue. So if you will, pick up that copy of God's Word, flip over to the book of Joshua, and read with me just simply verses 1 and 2. Verse 1 of Joshua 1, it says, After the death of Moses, the Lord's servant, the Lord spoke to Joshua, the one that was the son of Nun, who had served Moses. In verse 2 it says, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now you and all of the people prepare to cross over the Jordan to the land that I am giving the Israelites. All right, so let's look back at verse 1. Let's look at the Lord's servant. This statement joins the book of Joshua with the earlier narrated events at the end of Deuteronomy. For it was a time of transition, as I've already said, in which Moses, who was the chief human character of the book of, the, of Exodus and Leviticus, Numbers and Deuteronomy, will no longer be the, fut- the featured individual that we're talking about. The term servant of the Lord actually appeared also in Deuteronomy 34, 5, when it described Moses at his death. We're going to see this expression or this title is going to occur another 13 times in the book of Joshua as, if you will, a testimony or an epitaph to Moses himself. Matter of fact, if you look back at what I referenced there in Deuteronomy chapter 34, verses 5 and 12, there just to the left, if your copy of God's Word has got the book of Joshua printed up against the book of Deuteronomy, in Deuteronomy chapter 34, verse 5 through 12, Read with me here. It says, So Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab, as the Lord had said. Verse 6, He buried him in the valley, in the land of Moab, facing Beth Poor, and no one, no one to this day, knows where his grave is. For in verse 7, it says, For Moses was 120 years old when he died. His eyes were not weak, and his vitality had not left him. The Israelites wept for Moses in the plans of Moab, Moab for 30 days. Then the days of weeping and mourning for Moses came to an end. And then look at verse 9. It says, Then Joshua, the son of Nun, was filled with the spirit of wisdom because Moses had laid his hands upon him. So the Israelites obeyed him. They did as the Lord had commanded Moses. And no prophet has arisen again in Israel like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. He was unparalleled, and all the signs and the wonders the Lord sent him to do against the land of Egypt and to fare up into all of its officials and to all of his lands. For all of the mighty acts of power and the terrifying deeds that Moses performed in the sight of Israel. It reads like a great book and a great history lesson and a great narrative to see the transition from the one that was the great leader, from the one that had led them through And now Joshua was being tapped because he had been ordained, because hands had been laid upon him. See, during this period of transition, God was using Joshua to continue his plan for all of creation. Do you know that God is using you? 
God has chosen you for a time such as this. If you've accepted Christ, if you have made that commitment, if you've called upon Him, then He is going to use you to continue His plan for all of creation. Because at some point, all great individuals, all called individuals, all commissioned, commanded individuals will pass away. And God's going to need somebody to continue the work. In this case, God commissioned Joshua to achieve three things. If you look there, the three things were simple. Remember earlier in Deuteronomy 30, 20, three things were to love, to obey, and to remain faithful. Well, here, the three things that Joshua was being called to do was to lead the people into the land, to defeat an enemy, and then to ultimately claim that inheritance, the the inheritance that was given to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. See, God could have sent an angel to do all this, but what did he do? He chose to use a man and to give him the power he needed to get the job done. For as we've already seen and we will see through in this 24 chapters in the book of Joshua, is that Joshua is the type of Christ or a Messiah type figure. For us, Christ is the captain of our salvation. He is the one who won the victory and now shares a spiritual inheritance with us. And in this understanding, Joshua was doing that very thing for those that he was now in charge of, those that were awaiting his responsibilities, those that were awaiting his call to action and to do. But after verse 2, verses 3 through 6, we see that there were three promises, but it was also to fulfill three specific tasks. So if you will, grab your copy of God's Word again and look with me. In Joshua chapter 1, starting in verse 3 through 6, It reads, I have given you every place. I've given you every place where the sole of your foot treads, just as I promised Moses. For your territory will be from the wilderness in Lebanon to the great Euphrates River and all of the land of the Hittites and west of the Mediterranean Sea. Verse 5, for no one will be able to stand against you as long as you live, for I will be with you just as I was with Moses. I will not leave you. I will not forsake you. Be strong. And courageous, for you will distribute the land I swore to the fathers to give them as an inheritance. At this pivotal point in Israel's history, God spoke to Joshua, reminding him of his specific promise to his people with specific detail. Because if you look back at verse 5 there, what exactly does it say in verse 5? It says, No one will be able to stand against you. Not only that, But no one will be able to sin against you as long as you live, and I will be with you just as I was with Moses. I will not leave you or forsake you. And then in verse 6, the first of many times that we see these words, be strong, be courageous, for I will distribute to you the land that I swore to the fathers and give them as an inheritance. See, God spoke to Joshua and of the specific promise to his people with this intense, specific detail. God laid out for Joshua what he would do through his life and his leadership. And the rest of the book demonstrates God's faithfulness to fulfill his promise to now his servant, Joshua. See, I think we can identify if Joshua was fearful of the task he had been given. I mean, I would. If I was being, if I was there and I've only encountered God through my teacher, through my mentor, Moses, and I've heard the voices and I've heard the commands and I've been witness to it, but now... The Lord is directly speaking to him. And he ends this section by saying, be strong and be courageous. See, in verses 1 through 5, God reassured Joshua with a reminder of his covenant promises to his people. I want to ask you, where do you turn when you face a difficult task? See, in our own strength, a difficult task can seem hopeless. Yet God, God provides hope and he does so in his promises to be with us through the hardships and uses us for his purpose. We can trust because of this right here. We can trust that God will be faithful to his people. See, I firmly believe Joshua had a threefold task to perform. God gave him three special promises, and for each one there was a task that God would enable Joshua to be able to perform. The first one was he was to cross over the river and to claim the land in verses 3 through 4. See, God had already given them the land, and it was their responsibility now to step out by faith and claim it. What has God already given you? What is your faith step? See, the lesson for us today is clear. God has given all of us spiritual blessings in Christ, and we must step out by faith and claim them. 
For as it's stated, if we go to the complete end of the Bible in the New Testament, in Revelation, it says, for he is set before his church an open door. It talks about we must step through that door by faith and claim everything for the Lord. Friends, it is impossible to stand still in Christian life and service, for when you stand still, you begin to slip and you'll, pretend, and you'll begin to start going backwards. The door's been open, and we have to step through it in faith. The second task that he gave Joshua to do in verse 5 there was to defeat the enemy. In verse 5, we can read of the promises of the victory over that enemy. And what a promise God gave to Joshua. It says, as I was with Moses. That was that reminder. It was like he was looking at him saying, hey, think about this. You saw it, you witnessed. As we ascended the mountaintop, as he came down with the tablets, as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you or forsake you. I mean, think of the times that your primary caregiver, your mom, your dad, made that promise to you that no matter what happens, I will never forsake you or leave you. See, God had given a similar promise to Jacob as well in Genesis 28, 15. And, and, had, and Moses had repeated God's promise to Joshua. God would one day give that same promise to Gideon and to the Jewish exiles returning from Babylon to their land. Not only that, he would give it to David and give it to his son Solomon. But best of all, and this is the best part of all, God has given this promise to his people today. He has given that promise to you and to me. The Gospel of Matthew in the New Testament opens up with Emmanuel, God with us us. And it closes with Jesus saying, Lo, I am with you always till the end of the earth. The writer of Hebrews in Hebrews chapter 13 verse 5 quotes Joshua 1 5 and applies it to the Christians today by saying, I will never leave you nor will I forsake you. Go ahead, look at that. In Hebrews chapter 13 verse 5, quoting back to this very verse in Joshua Chapter 1, verse 5. The third task was that was given to Joshua was a division of the land to each tribe as its inheritance. See, this was God's assurance that the enemy would be defeated and and that the nation of Israel would possess their land, that God would keep his promises to Abraham and that his descendants would inherit the land forever. And you can read this in Genesis in various different locations. God didn't give Joshua explanations as to how he would accomplish these things. Because God's people live on promises. We don't live on explanations. See, when you trust God's promises and you step out by faith, as it indicated in verse 3, you can be sure that the Lord will give you. He will give you the directions you need when you need them. Again, it's kind of like your parents saying, you will know when you need to know. This opening verses, verses 1 through 9, continues in verses 7 through 9. And this is where we'll conclude today that God's Word brings encouragement to those that are seeking to be obedient. If you will, pick up your copy again of God's Word in Joshua chapter 1, starting in verse 7. It says there, above all, here it is again, above all, be strong and be very courageous to carefully observe the whole instruction my servant Moses commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left, so that you will have success wherever you go. And then verse 8, this book of instruction must not depart from your mouth. You are to recite it day and night so that you may carefully observe everything that's written in it. For then you will prosper and succeed in whatever you do. For verse 9, haven't I commanded you? Again, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or discouraged for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. So let's go back to last week. Where had Joshua been up to this point? All along walking beside Moses, the young man beside the older one. For 40 years, yet God's command to Joshua was not not just general. It was not to, quote, try to remember what Moses told you and follow it. Rather, Joshua was to search out and to constantly study the sharp, defining, definite commands that were written in the book. It's one thing to say to a leader, be strong and to be courageous. In essence, go and be great and be quite something else to enable him to do it. It's easy to say, go do. 
But if you have the tools and the task and the things within your toolkit to go and do this, you should be able to do it. Joshua's strength and courage would come from these things. Meditating on God's Word, believing in its promises, obeying its commands. Is that not what we should be doing today? Our strength and courage would come from that quiet time, that believing in the promises that are written on the pages of these books and obeying its commands. This was the counsel that had been given, that this was the counsel that Moses had given to all of the people. And now God was applying it specifically to Joshua. Friends, remember, Moses himself kept a written record of God's word, his law. I mean, we know this because of the Pentateuch, because of the Torah, because of what is said there. If you remember at the top of the hour I read, or at the top of the time read Deuteronomy 30, 20. Well, if you go to the next chapter over in Deuteronomy 31, we see where it is indicated there. I think it's around verse 9 or 10 where it says, Moses wrote down this law. He wrote it down and he gave it to the priests, the leaders, the pastors, the individuals. He gave it to, I think it says even to the sons of Levi who carried the ark of the Lord's covenant and to all the elders of Israel. We know that Moses wrote these things down and that he provided it with everyone, for everyone. But if you continue reading in Deuteronomy chapter 31 in the following verses, when you get down towards the end of it there, we see that Moses, when he had finished writing down on a scroll, it says every single word that he wrote down, he commanded those very Levites who carried the ark of the Lord of the covenant. It, it was something like he said, take this book, take this law, place it beside the ark of the covenant to the Lord your God so that it may remain there as a witness so it may be there as a witness against you and of the greatness of God. We have reason to believe that the entire five books of Moses, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, was comprised or called the book of the law, the greatest legacy that Moses could have ever left to his successor, one that was not named at that time and ultimately was named in Joshua. But it wasn't enough for the priests to carry. It wasn't enough for them to guard this precious book. Joshua had to take the time to read it daily, to make it part of his inner person by meditating on it. It's one thing for us to walk the aisles of a store in our local communities, in our city, and we see different copies of this and different translations and all of it set up there. And we see that when we walk in any minister's office or, or any other place where spiritual gatherings take place, we see plenty of copies of God's Word where people have saved them even I have a family Bible that's got even some of the markings and writings from my mom and dad. But it was their studies. It was given to Joshua in that verse 8. Meditate on it. Guide it in your heart. Joshua had to take time to read it daily and make it part of his inner person by meditating on it, by studying it, by saturating. I mean, the Hebrew word translated meditate means to mutter, means to say it over and over again. It was a practice of the Jewish faith. Remember, I said there at the top in Deuteronomy 6, 5, where the Shema, and they would recite it over and over again at every gathering. And to this day, if you walked into a temple, if you walked into a Jewish synagogue, you would hear the rereading of the Shema. And it was the practice of their faith to read Scripture aloud and to talk about it to themselves and to one another. This explains why God warned Joshua that the book of the law was not, was not to depart out of his mouth. Friends, if you don't talk to your Bible, your Bible isn't likely to talk to you. If you don't spend time with God, you're missing out. There's so much here in these first nine verses that's going to continue to set the path and the trajectory for the rest of biblical history. God did a mighty work in His chosen one, the one that was a servant, the one that became the teacher, the one that became the ultimate leader. Yes, He had difficult moments. Yes, He had some obstacles to overcome, and we will see that in the coming weeks through this series. But ultimately, he was charged with the simple words, be strong and be courageous. And he had to remember what was written previously when he heard his master Moses, his teacher 
Moses say, love, obey, and remain faithful. And then you will be able to enjoy the inheritance of the land that was promised to your forefathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. How is your faith? Are you committed as much as Joshua was? Are you aware that maybe even he was scared as you would be scared to do such? Here at Union Avenue Baptist Church, our prayer is that you would come to know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, that you would embrace what he did on the cross for you, that you would acknowledge that he went to the tomb on your behalf and then he rose again on the third day. And in doing that, he was obedient to his Father. And in his own words and his own writings in the Gospel of John, he said, For I am the way, the truth, and life, and no one can come to the Father except through me. He is your deliverer, your sustainer. He's looking to take you to eternity. Joshua had the same task for a different group of people. He was to, to deliver them to their forever eternal inheritance and land. I look forward to being on this journey with each and every one of you, whether online or in person, as we continue to study the book of Joshua in the coming weeks in these first three chapters where he was told three simple things. Go be great. Will you join with me as we pray? Almighty Heavenly God, I thank you for the challenges, for the difficulties, for the uncertainties, and that we are reminded to be a salt and light that we're to go and proclaim and to teach, that we're to speak and to share and to profess your word to those that will listen. Lord, I thank you for the example that's set in the early readings in the early life of Moses as not only was he being obedient to you, but he was also seeking someone out to teach and to guide and to lead. Remind us to do that as well. Lord, for the individual that may be watching this online or received the link from a friend, followed a click on social media. Lord, I pray if they don't know you, that they would seek you out, that they would call upon you as their Lord. For those of us that do know you, remind us to always be on the ready, to be able to step out and to share and to proclaim and to teach. Lord, I thank you that we can open your word, that we can read it, that we can learn from it, and that we can go and apply it. For it's in your precious holy name we do pray, and amen.